All right. Well, I titled the message Overcoming Anxiety, but before I get into that, I want to start with painting a few pictures for you guys. You guys okay with that? So they're going to bring the canvases out. No, I'm just playing. I'm going to actually use word pictures. You guys like word pictures? I've been working on them. It's been kind of fun. So I want to paint three pictures for you. So we're going to start with the first one. I want you to picture it. You're asleep. And then suddenly, in the middle of the night, you were woken. You're not woken with the fear that you heard someone in your house. You're not woken with the odd feeling that some animal is staring at you. But you're woken with this worry, the worry of what has taken place throughout the day prior. All the events, all the interactions, all the things that have come upon you, you are racing through your mind. And you really just truly want to go back to sleep, but you can't. The wondering of, well, what happened with that conversation is it going to carry over to today? Did I make the right choice in choosing the things that I needed to to set up for what was going to take place tomorrow? But you're exhausted and you're tired. So you look over at the clock and realize, wow, it's only 2.30 in the morning. I can do this. I can go back to sleep and everything will be all right. So you lay there, you get comfortable, you close your eyes. But for the next what seems like an eternity, all the different thoughts, the different questions, the different what-ifs and could-have happens are racing through your mind. Overwhelmed by it, tossing a little bit, you decide that you can't take it anymore and you look at the clock only to realize that the number staring back at you read 2.35. Really? It's only been five minutes? It seemed like forever. No, no, really, I gotta, I gotta get back to sleep. I gotta be rested for the morning. So you figure out a way to get comfortable again. You close your eyes. It doesn't work. You toss. The thoughts keep running and racing through. What if? Did I make the right decision? Did I, did, did I do this right? Is it going to be okay? Is it going to work out? Eternity, as it seems again, has gone past. And you're at the point where you're like, yeah, but it really, I know what happened last time when I did this. It was five minutes. You can't take it anymore. The anxiety has reached a point where you open your eyes again with the one eye look this time at the clock. And you see the numbers, 3, 45, an hour? For reals, an hour went by this time? I need my sleep. I need to rest. I need to be ready for the day that's coming. Maybe that's not quite you. Maybe for you, it's a little bit later in the morning. You're at work. You've been working. You're preparing for the meeting that you're about to go into. You have all the facts. You have all the information that you need to prepare and to present. You have your pie charts, your bar graphs. You have your keynote presentation. You are ready to take on the meeting. You walk into the conference room with everyone else. You're working through. You're hearing the talks, the different conversations. And all of a sudden, you're watching as it goes around the table, getting closer and closer to you, your turn. And it's in that moment when the conversation transitions and it's been brought up the topic that you're to share on, and all of a sudden, in that moment, everything freezes. Your mind is a complete blank. Everything around you appears to be as if it's black, and you're unsure, are you ready for this meeting? Did I bring the right charts? Do I know the right information? Will I be able to answer what if guys question? Because those are really tough sometimes. Am I prepared for what's ahead of me? Will I give the presentation well? Now maybe for our younger folks that are in the room, your life is a little bit different. It's after lunch, it's mid-afternoon. You're sitting in your classroom. You're sitting in your desk. The teacher has just handed out the quiz that you knew was coming. You've prepared for it. You've studied. You're ready as you walked into the room. But now as you sit there with that test in front of you, you look down and you look up at the clock and you look down again. You look through the papers. You look back up and realize 15 minutes just went by. What the heck? You look down at the, qu the quiz again, scrolling through it, wondering what's going on. You look up and realize... Another 15 minutes went by and I haven't written my name down yet and I got to answer a 100 question quiz in 10 minutes. To be honest, everyone is familiar with anxiety. It's a problem most of us face and if we're honest, we face anxiety on some level every day. And the crazy thing is, as we go through these little battles of anxiety, to be honest with you, people around us have no clue what's going on in our life. 
So today we're going to be looking at overcoming anxiety. This is a message for those that are anxious about something. This could be for those of you that are anxious about a health issue that you or your loved one is facing right now. This could be a person who is anxious over the fact of their aging parents. And what does that mean not only for their parents, but for them and their life? Maybe it's the flip of that. Maybe you're anxious over your children and the decisions that they're making, and you're wondering, are they going down the right path? Because surely after this, it's not going to be too long. They will no longer be in my house, under my roof, and I will be able to guide them in a way that would set them on a path. Or just maybe you're anxious about your finances and you're frustrated for the season that you're in because you're wondering, will there be peace? Will we make it to the other side of this situation? This is a message for those that are heavy-hearted, worried, battling with fear, and some sort of form of anxiety. So we're going to find ourselves this morning looking at overcoming anxiety, and we're going to be in the book of Philippians, chapter 4 to be specific. So if you would make your way there, that'd be great. If you're wondering where it is, it's in the New Testament. It's in the epistles, the letters to the churches. So after 1st and 2nd Corinthians, it's God eats popcorn, which is Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. All right? You can make your way there. And I want to tell you this, the passage that we're going to be looking at in overcoming anxiety is a passage today that is called a perspective, a prescriptive passage of the Bible. Simply, what does that mean? Well, the Bible falls into two parts, descriptive passages, passages that we would read to tell an account, tell how something happened or went down and we can learn from the way others did things or didn't do things, right? And then there's prescriptive passages of the Bible that have instructions that prescribe something for us to do. And they give us a way that simply teaches us how to do something to make a better action. And I want to start with this too. And I want you to know that I do understand that there are many different forms of anxiety. There's people that deal with chemical anxiety that throws their body off and they meet with doctors who give them medication and that is needed. There's also people that don't want the medication in their life, so they go to what's called a dietitian, and they try to adapt and change their diet to help with their anxiety. Well, I'm not a doctor, and I'm not a dietitian. I'm a pastor, I'm a teacher. So what I have to offer today is basically God's prescription, God's truth in how to deal with overcoming anxiety. Because honestly, you really don't want me telling you what meds to take. And you really don't want me telling you what foods to eat because you're probably not going to like what I tell you. So we're going to look at God's truth and what he prescribes for us. Amen? So with that, today is a day of doing things a little bit different. I know God's word is awesome and great. I want to do this. Would you please stand with me as we read God's word this morning? All right. In Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse 6, it says here, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God, and that the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. All right, go ahead and take a seat, and as you do, please give your neighbor a high five. Hopefully there will be no face hits. As we come to this passage here in Philippians, we have to understand that Paul wrote these words as he sat in prison. And not only did he sit in prison, but he sat chained to guards 24 hours a day. And it was in this place that he was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write these words to the church of Philippi, and that were handed on to so many other churches, including ourselves. And in thinking of where Paul found himself, if anyone had a reason to be anxious, it would have been Paul. Because he sat in prison, chained to guards 24 hours a day, waiting for a trial. Waiting to find out the outcome 
of his life. He faced an uncertainty, an uncertain future of what was before him. But yet when he writes these words, he gives us a different perspective of anxiety. So, how can we overcome anxiety? The first thing we're going to look at today is what is anxiety? Paul begins simply in this passage in verse 6 there saying, be anxious for nothing. Now, I don't know about you, but when I hear those words, be anxious for nothing, I kind of wonder, is that possible? Is it possible in this day and age to not be anxious about life? When I look at the fact of the news coverage, we get newspapers. Does anyone still get a newspaper? A few of you, okay. Newspapers delivered to your home with the news and current events of things going on. We have news programs that keep us up to date on what's going on, and news is now listed 24 hours a day on some stations. All those things that are happening, we're bombarded with, and it makes me wonder, could I not be anxious? Statistically speaking, we're at a day and time where we are the most stressed people. Not because we just have news coming into us, we have this thing called social media. Are many of you a part of that? The crazy thing about social media is you can find out news before it becomes news. And yet, Paul tells me here that I'm to be anxious for nothing. How am I to be anxious for nothing when I find out about a mass shooting? followed up by another bigger, terrible mass shooting. How am I to be, not be, anxious? Or how do I deal with the fact of news reports of violent storms of mass destruction from floods to earthquakes to tornadoes, and I'm to not be anxious? Or how is it that I'm supposed to try and live and get through this life in a financial freedom when yet I realize minimum wage is on the increase and jobs are on the decrease, and I'm to not be anxious. You see, anxiety is, a, is the stress about future uncertainty, or simply stress over what may happen in the future, either be now or far off. And as we'll look at it in a little bit, it may be even those uncertainties that are real or imagined in our minds. To be anxious or to not be anxious is a difficult thing. And in thinking of that, is it really something that people deal with and go through and make their life through? And they do. But the thing is, is we have to work to get to a place to realize to not be anxious. And the crazy thing is, is this wasn't something that's been just new to us. Like I said, we are at the most stressful time. But to be honest with you, this was something that even Jesus dealt with and shared on. You see, in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus delivers this powerful sermon called the Sermon on the Mount. And in this message, he talks about all sorts of things, from the Beatitudes and the right mindset to get into heaven that we need to have, to talking about how he came to fulfill the law, not destroy the law. And then he talks through this series of talks that he words the beginning of them with, you have heard that it was said, and he follows up with, but do it this way instead. And then he goes through the Christian life and how to live, And then he comes to this section at the end of chapter 6 in his sermon, and he says in verses 25 through 34, where he talks about being anxious and how we should not be anxious. He starts the passage off actually this way, and he says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. He goes on in the passage, and he talks about how the birds have the food that they need to live, how the fields are dressed and clothed with what they need to to survive. How much more is he going to care for us? He goes on in verse 27, he says, And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? I don't know if you remember, remember those pictures that I painted at the beginning? Did you notice in each of those pictures, none of them, anyone gained time? They all did what? Lost time. Being anxious is not going to add to our life. It's going to take away from our life. And Jesus reiterates the fact of, why are you anxious? If I feed the birds of the air and I dress the hillsides, how much more am I going to take care of my children? To feed my children, to clothe my children in what they need. 
And he ends out the passage saying this in verse 34. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. He's simply reminding the folks and us that in Christ we do not have to be anxious. We don't have to worry about what's going to come. We don't have to worry with the things that are going on that it's going to hinder our life. Because in doing each of these things, the only thing that we're going to gain is the loss of something. But our anxiety takes us over with thoughts that are real and imagined, and our well-being is unsure of what lies before us. So we come to this morning our first, so what? And we ask this question, do I realize what anxiety really is? A warning. When Paul wrote the words, be anxious for nothing, it could simply be read as a command. But remember how I told you we were looking at a prescriptive passage? Well, with a prescriptive passage, is going to tell you something and then show you what to do. What we're going to see here is to be anxious for nothing isn't so much a command, but as a warning. A warning to do something or something bad will happen if we don't take action. And I was thinking through, like, how can I share this to connect the dots here of looking at anxiety as a warning? Well, as I was listening to a pastor, he painted this picture that marvelously connected the dots for me, and I want to share it with you. You guys ready? Now, most of you drive, right? Now, you all drive, which, or most of you drive. That's great. So I have a question. On your dashboard, there is a light that you really love well, right? And I'm not talking about the low tire light. That one is annoying. But I'm talking about that red or orange light. You know what light I'm talking about? Check engine light. I don't know about you, but um, I've had my truck for 15 years, and the check engine light has never once come on. So I thought it was broken. Reasonable assumption, right? Well, I majorly had some, I recently had some major work done on my truck, and it was a couple months afterwards, and I'm driving down the road, and all of a sudden, the check engine light came on. And I'm, I'm sorry to say it, but in that moment, a little bit of anxiety rolled into my life. Because all of a sudden, I began to wonder, what the heck? What am I going to do? Should I stop right here in the middle of the road? Should I pull over? Should I just keep driving? If my truck blows up, will insurance cover it? I don't know. What am I to do? The check engine light came on. It hasn't come on in 15 years. It's kind of scary when it comes on. But I'll be honest with you, I was a little anxious at that moment because a lot of things went through my mind. Things that were concerns, questions, problems that came up in my mind that probably wouldn't even happen to my truck. But they all came up, right? Let's go back to the check engine light. The check engine light. I'm going to ask you this. What is the check engine light? And I'll give you this. The check engine light is not the problem. The check engine light signals there is a problem somewhere else in the car. And that check engine light signals that if you're smart, smart moment, right? If you're smart... Check engine light comes on, you're smart, you do what? You take the car to the manufacturer. And why do you take the car to the manufacturer? They created the car. They know the car. They know how the car works, which means they know how to fix the car. You see, the light is not the problem. The light is a signal indicating you have a problem and you should take it to the one who can fix it. So what is anxiety? Anxiety is many things, but what we're going to see is anxiety is a warning. It's a warning that you need to go to the one who created us. Anxiety is a warning that we need to go to God. We need to seek the creator, seek the one who made us, the one who understands us, has developed us, and knows what we need and how to fix us. You see, as the check engine light is an indicator and a warning to go to the creator, its creator. Anxiety is our warning to go to our creator who can fix us. And when we understand what anxiety is, a warning to go to God, then we have to do the second thing that we're going to look at today is what to do when faced with anxiety. We have all been faced with anxiety, which is a warning for us to go to God because he is our creator. He knows us better than we know ourselves. So he knows how to fix us where we think we know how to fix ourselves, correct? So how do we go to God? 
Well, it's right here in this passage that we read, right? Looking back at it, Philippians, right? Chapter 4. So let's read it and see. So it says in verse 6, be anxious for nothing. The warning, right? And then it says, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and minds through Christ Jesus. So when we're faced with anxiety, we have to go to God in prayer. And when we go to him in prayer, basically we're talking to God, right? And there's a lot of different formal ways that we could get into that, but we're not looking at that right now. We're going to keep it simple. We're just simply going to talk to God. You see, we're going to pray to God. And when the warning of anxiety comes up, it's this idea that a problem is big enough for you to worry about. It's big enough for you to pray about. Do you get that? If a problem is big enough to worry about, it's big enough to pray about. So Paul reminds us that we have to be in talks, in prayer with God, bringing to him, as it said there, let him know the, your request. Basically, let him know what's going on. Give him the worries. Talk it out with them. Don't do the high school thing of when you ask your high schooler, how was school today? Fine. God's not looking for a one-word answer with you. He wants to hear from you. Why? Because when he hears from you, he really grasps and knows what needs to take place in your life to correct the problem. So we have to come to God and we have to tell him the things that are bothering us. He wants to hear from us so that he can fix us and take it forward. And if we listen again, look what he says. He says, let your request be made known to God. And then the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, which will guard your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. Did you see that? So God tells us if we go to him and we tell him the things that are bothering us, he's going to give us something. You see what he's going to give us there? He's going to give us the peace of God. And I don't know about you, but this peace of God part sounds really great. Because he actually defines it right there. Kind of like when you watch the new TV and the ads pop up for those medications, and they list all the side effects, and you're like, yeah, I'm not taking that. I don't care. This isn't one of those moments where he lists the things, and you're like, I don't want that. This is one of the things where you're like, dude, I want the peace of God. Because did you see what it does? It said there at the end of the verse, what does the peace of God do? It surpasses all understanding and will guard your hearts and mind. I don't know about you, but my mind is my biggest enemy. My mind can take me places I don't want to go. My mind can raise a lot of what ifs, a lot of false realities, and misguided truths. I don't know about you, but I really could use the peace of God to guard my mind and my heart. Amen? So what? Our second so what that we're going to look at today is this. Are, you taking, are we taking our anxiety to God? Or I'll have you ask the question this way. Do I go to God in prayer when facing my anxiety, or do I hold on to it? Do I try to fix my problems, or do I actually give them over to God? As I mentioned at the beginning, this is a prescriptive passage, a passage which gives specific instruction, prescribes to us something to do and to basically follow in obedience. So if anxiety is the warning, then the, what we're supposed to do out of obedience in this passage would be to pray to God and give Him our cares so that we can get back from Him the peace of God. I know what you're already thinking, Roy, I have a really hard time with giving things up. I get you. I understand that. One of the toughest things that we can do is give something to God and be able to say, hey, God, I know you got this. Let me know how it works out in the end. It's difficult. Because why? We like to fix ourselves. We like to be the hero, forgetting the fact that we didn't create ourselves. We don't know ourselves that well as God does. And when we come to God and we give those things to him, we can see what he wants to do in our lives. And it is a hard place to find. But so how do we approach this coming to God and praying and asking him to fix our problems? Do we come and kind of beat around the bush? So God, I was like having this thing go down the other day. And um, so uh, you want to help me out? Do we just kind of blunt drop it? God, I got this problem. Can you fix it? How do we come to God in a way where when we re 
come to him, it's met with truth, but yet we're going to receive back the blessings that we need to. For that, I want to look at what Peter told us in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 through 7. He said, Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. And in verse 7 says there, casting all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. We have to approach God when we come to him to talk and in prayer. We have to be humble and giving. And I was trying to think, how do I best describe this? How do I come to God humbly, but yet giving? I mean, I do want him to fix stuff in my life, but yet I don't want to look like I always got problems in my life either. Well, I came across in this idea, and it popped into my head, was this thing when we go into battle. There's two things that can happen in battle when one raises their hands. When one puts their hands up at one point in battle, it can show a sign of surrender, that you're giving up, that one is no longer in control but get surrendering to the one that is greater. And to be honest with you, this is a place where all humility is gone and where a person is their most humble because they are at another's mercy. And if we come to God with our hands up and surrender, we are saying that, God, we are at your mercy for what you would have for us. But on the same side of that, in battle, in the end, if you raise your hand, it also can mean a sign of what? Victory. That you have won the battle. And this is a place where victory can be claimed because the battles have been won So when we come to God in prayer, that humble and giving attitude, we have to lift our hands to God. When we surrender to Him our anxieties, we find ourselves at a place where we are, have you been waiting for it, right? Anxious for nothing. And in being anxious for nothing, then we can claim victory because we have won the battle of anxiety and allowing God to fight for us, and we can claim the prize of the peace of God in our life. That is how we come to Christ. We want to see him do a work in our life. At this time, I'm going to do something a little bit different again. You guys not okay with this? All right. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up and join us, and they're going to play here in a few minutes, but I'm going to walk you through what's going to take place over the next few minutes. See, I want to do something different right now. I know a lot of times people can get up there and they can preach a great message, they can teach you something great, and you will take that information, you will put it in your head, put it in the back of your mind, and you will walk out of here saying, I'm going to do that later. But this time, I don't want to do that. What I want to do is we've been looking at this and coming to this point, I want to follow through with those actions. So in a few moments, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to encourage everyone who's fighting a battle of anxiety, because I know we are all at some battle, whether it be today, tomorrow, or the weeks to come, we are in a battle with anxiety. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to simply here in a few minutes, I'm going to ask you to stand and raise your hands and surrender. But before we get there, I want to help you get to that place where you can see the need to come to Christ in a surrendering mind so that you can claim victory. And I'm going to go back to the verses here that Peter wrote in chapter 5, where he said, Therefore humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Because what I want you to understand is the Peter that wrote this right here is the same Peter that stuck his foot in his mouth every time he opened it. It's the same Peter who should have remained silent but spoke up and said something stupid. It's the same Peter who was on the boat with the other 12 in the midst of the storm who saw the Savior walking on the water. It's the same Peter who stepped out of the boat and walked on the raging sea. And it was in that moment that Peter I'm sure had a moment of anxiety when he saw the waves crashing around him and lost everything that was going on begin to sink. And as he went down, Jesus was there in front of him. And I can tell you what Jesus didn't do. He didn't sit there and rub it in Peter's face and tell him, way to go, you did the same thing all over again. Are you ever going to learn? He didn't beat him up. 
He didn't leave them to try to swim back to the boat or to shore, but no. As Peter sank and Jesus stood over him, Jesus offered his hand, his arm to Peter. And it's in that moment Peter had to make a choice as he found himself under God's mighty hand. And that choice was to raise up and surrender to Christ, to be pulled up. And Peter made that decision, casting his cares to him, and Christ, in the right time, pulled Peter up out of that water, placed him back in the boat, giving him victory in that life.